part tonight. Tomorrow night, last night of the meeting, we're looking at Bible prophecy. If you ever ask the question, what happens on planet Earth after Jesus Christ comes and takes the church home? Tomorrow night, we're going to look at that. It'll be an opportunity for you to invite, pray, and have folks here. How many of you have been inviting folks, and at this point, you think you have a guest coming tomorrow night? Would you raise your hand real high? I believe I have somebody coming. Some of you like that? Good. If you don't have that promise, do everything you can to get them here. Uh, turn the school bus sideways in the front yard and make sure everybody gets in here from off the highway. And if you're still inviting, do everything you can to have them here and be with us. Take your Bible tonight, please. Go to the book of 1 Samuel in chapter number 1. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. Had supper tonight with your pastor and two of the children. I am impressed with his vision and his passion for the things of God. And I hope that you'll catch that same vision, labor with him, help things move forward right here in Simpsonville, South Carolina. All right, let's stand please for the reading and teaching of the Word of God tonight. 1 Samuel chapter number 1, and I'm going to start my reading down in verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they'd eaten in Shiloh, and after they'd drunk, now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. She was in bitterness of soul, and prayed to the Lord, and wept sore. She vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou would indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then will I give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head." came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she'd been drunken. Verse 17, Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition, which thou have asked of him. Verse 20, Wherefore it came to pass, when well, the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived, she bare a son, called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Hannah had her prayer answered, and so could you. We're going to learn some principles for praying tonight. You know, I'm finding as I'm traveling, God is more interested in answering than many believers are in asking. So we're going to learn how to ask and see some answers as God moves in our lives in a very special way. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our friends who have joined us on Tuesday night. If there's anybody here without Christ, may they understand they need to pray and invite Christ to come live in their life. And for those of us that are saved, we pray with the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. Not only teach us that we ought to, but how we ought to. And transform us by this time as we learn together some principles for prevailing prayer. All in Jesus' name, amen. Greatest privilege of the child of God is the privilege of prayer. Stop and think about this. God is inviting you and me into his throne room to carry on a perpetual conversation with him. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I'll answer thee, show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amazingly enough, our greatest privilege is usually our greatest problem. Some years ago, a periodical was placed on my desk. If it was accurately written and the survey was performed right, the man said the average Christian prays four minutes a day, said the average preacher prays seven minutes a day. And then we wonder why no major move of God in these United States. Dear friend, whatever you and I are is what we are on our knees in private before a holy God. Whatever's wrong with you and me is basically wrong with our prayer life. My goal tonight is not to insult or intimidate you, but by God's grace to instruct and inspire you to learn to pray. The lady's name is Hannah. She's married to a man by the name of Elkanah. For some reason, Elkanah married two wives. Do not ask me why he did that. I couldn't answer that for any man. If God had wanted man to have more than one wife, he could have started it that way. But he only made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve, Francis and Sarah. Thank you very much. One man for one woman for one lifetime. But unfortunately, he marries two wives, and this I'm sure of. You take two women, put them in the same house with the same man, you got problems 24-7. The other lady's name was Penini, and she had children, but Hannah had none. Hannah was barren. She's a picture of many barren born-again believers. She had no fruit of her womb. She had a husband and a home, but no fruit of her womb. If you're saved, we have a husband in Jesus, and he's coming to take us home soon. But unfortunately, many born-again believers are barren when it comes to the fruit of souls. 
Zondervan Research said recently 97% of people who say I'm saved have no active evangelistic outreach at all. Barrenness. There's the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against this there is no law. Meekness means very teachable. Are you a teachable Christian? Long-suffering means you're extremely patient. The joy of the Lord's your strength. you got to give Hannah E for effort. She came to this conclusion. What my husband and I cannot do naturally, God Almighty can do supernaturally. And God sent her a baby boy named Samuel. And I want you to know tonight, Hannah's God is our God. So let's learn what the principles were in her life. Look down first, and please, at verse 11. The Bible says she vowed a vow. If you're taking notes, and I would encourage you to do that, write this down. Number one, if you pray and you pray effectively, you must come seriously. In the mind of a Jew, nothing was more serious than a vow. A vow was a promise that could not be broken. Ecclesiastes 5.5, 5, better not to vow a vow than to vow and defer, defer to pay. Judges 11.30, Jephthah said, I've opened my mouth unto the Lord. I cannot go back. If you want God to hear you, we cannot come flippantly. We must come fervently. Jeremiah 29.13 says, you'll seek me and find me. Here it comes. When you search for me with your whole heart. The Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven six, He that cometh unto God must believe that he is. He's a rewarder of them, don't miss the word, that diligently seek him. James 5, 16 says, Confess your faults one another. Pray for one another. The effectual, we get our term energetic from that word. The effectual fervent or boiling hot prayer of a righteous man avails much. If you're a carnal Christian with a complacent prayer life, don't expect to be heard. But if you're a person who's right with God and who's in desperation, God hears the prayers of desperate Christians. One of the things, God showed up on Sunday morning and people were saved because a number of you prayed. Everywhere I go, when people really bombard heaven, God shows up in a big way. I pulled into a certain church in North Carolina. I'd been with that pastor before. He said to me, I've got some men coming tonight, and they're going to pray. This was Saturday night. He said, you do the preaching, we'll do the praying. But I went to the prayer meeting anyway. When I got there, the parking lot had a lot of cars in it. I walked into the side of the church. Nobody was standing, nobody was sitting, and nobody was kneeling. Up and down every aisle, all across the front of the auditorium, were men prostrate, pleading with God to rent the heavens and come down. You get an atmosphere like that, people can be saved. The next morning, they had a friend day. The place was full. They had 35 people trust Jesus. They had been praying. They'd have 100 people come as visitors. Over 100 people trusted Jesus Christ. You say, wow, what a meeting. The meeting was on before I ever got there. They were meeting with God. Two times this summer, I preached to about 1,000 young people in two different camps, and over 100 young people in each one of the services came to the foot of the cross and trusted Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, that's unusual. Here's what's unusual. Getting God's people to really seriously seek God. So when you come, you must come seriously. But notice again, the Bible says, If thou wilt look on the affliction of thy handmaid, note that word, verse 11, remember me, not forget thine handmaid, there it is again, but we'll give thine handmaid a man child. Three times the same word handmaid appears, and it means in the original language, female slave. Now watch, when she came, she came seriously. When she came, she came submissively. She did not come bossing God, she came begging. Psalm 9 and verse 12, he forgets not the cry, don't miss words, they mean something, of the humble. Psalm 86, 1, bow down the ear and hear, for I am poor and needy. Now some of you may have believed all of your life that God hears every prayer. It's not true. Psalm 66, 18, the psalmist said, if I regard iniquity in my heart. In other words, I'm aware there's no sin in my life. The Lord will not hear me. Isaiah 66, 2, to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. You know, the Bible tells us in James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud. Strong word, but he gives grace to the humble. 
Resist is a military term, and I don't know exactly how it works, but evidently when a rebellious, unrepentant Christian prays and fires that prayer to heaven, somehow it's blocked. And if you've ever said, I don't know, my prayers are getting higher than the ceiling, they may not be. Because you can find this, if you resist God, He will resist you. For instance, sir, the Bible tells you and me as husbands that we're to dwell with our wives according to knowledge. We're to honor and treat them as the weaker vessel, as heirs together the grace of God, lest your prayers be hindered. Did you realize tonight, sir, if you're not right with your wife, you're not right with God? Did you realize if you don't get right with your wife, you have no authority to pray? You cannot mistreat her and be unkind to her and then all of a sudden hit your knees and expect to be heard in heaven. The Bible says your prayer has been hindered. Ma'am, you may be a gossip and you may tell things and talk to other ladies. You know, Pastor, gossiping used to be by the tongue, now it's by the thumbs. It's called texting. And it's an amazing thing that goes on sometimes while you're preaching. That it's not always women that do it. I was preaching in Virginia, and this fellow came in, and I knew he had gone to some Bible college because he had a chip on his shoulder when he walked in. And uh, I, I was preaching, and he was over there. His thumbs were on fire. So I just stepped out in the crowd, and I said, tell him I said hello and kept preaching. And all of a sudden, the texting stopped, and he started listening, and he came to the door, and he said, I'd like to apologize to you. I said, what would you want to do that for? And he said, well, I didn't like what you were saying. I didn't like the way you were preaching. I said, really? I couldn't tell. And he said, uh, I did start listening, and what you were saying is true, and I was wrong. And I said, son, you're forgiven, and I'm glad that you had that humility. But let me tell you, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying. You cannot slander and then turn around and pray and expect to be heard. If you're a young person still living at home, Ephesians 6.1, still in the Bible, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long upon the earth. Do you realize if you disobey and you disrespect your parents, you have no authority to pray. Here we are on Tuesday night. Most of you have been in the service Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, and we are Tuesday night. Can't you honestly say, so far in this meeting, I've obeyed everything God spoke to my heart about? You're the only one that can answer that. Nobody else can answer it for you. But I can tell you this, at which point you resist God, God resists you. Because if you're going to be heard when you pray, you must come seriously and you must come submissively. But I want you to notice in verse 11, there's another phrase. She says, give unto that handmaid a man child. Now she wanted to make a Nazarite out of him and I'll give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. So one, she came seriously and two, she came submissively and three, she came specifically. She was asking for a baby boy. You know, too many prayer meetings are generic. God bless us, God help us, God use us. Now, now folks, there are times, very frankly, we don't know exactly what we ought to pray. You ever had one of those times? I had one recently, and I said, Holy Spirit, I'm sure glad that you know what I need to pray because I can't even put it in words. But more times than not, we should be praying specifically. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Listen to the phrase, let your request, prayer request, be made known unto God. That's specific. Mark eleven twenty four. therefore whatsoever things you desire when you pray, things you desire, believe you shall receive them and ye shall have them. How long has it been since God specifically answered your prayer? I want you to think this thing through. When is the last time you sought God and you can go back and you can put beside that prayer a date and a time because God showed up in a big way? The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, well, that would be all of us. How many of you have ever come to a time and a place you had a decision, you weren't sure what to do? Raise your hand. It's a good time to pray. 
great time to kneel down and say, I don't know. I'm not sure which way to go. I'm not sure what the next step is. God said, if you lack wisdom and you'll ask me, I'll answer you, but you have to come in faith. I've heard pastors say, you know, we're not seeing as many young people go off a of full-time Christian service as we used to. Last week I was preaching in Greenville and a number of fellows from mission boards came and they told me about one mission board. They had one candidate this past year, one. Well, I think there's an answer to that. Matthew 9, 38 says, Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his field. Wouldn't it be great if Bible Baptist Church became a sending station for preachers and missionaries all around this world, and it wasn't just one or two, but there'd be quite a few come through there. Wouldn't that be exciting? Amen. Amen. Well, let me tell you how it could happen. Start having some Matthew 9, 38 prayer meetings. And pray for nothing except the Lord of the harvest, the thrust out of this congregation, men and women, to go into ministry. I was telling your pastor that's how my father was called to preach. In the church where he was, the pastor came and said, you know, we're having some missionaries retire, some are getting sick. If we don't get some new recruits, we're going to have to close some areas in different parts of the world. So businessmen came. My father told me as a young teenager, they didn't plan to stay all night, it just happened. He said, we prayed around, we prayed around again, prayed around again, and he said, then morning. And many of the men on their knees praying for others had been called to ministry. Among them was my father. He was a cost accountant, and God called him to go out to a church that had three people the first Sunday and take that ministry. He stayed 25 years. Next to him was a guy who climbed telephone poles for a living. His name was Bob. And Bob was called to go to Brazil, South America, where he stayed for over 40 years. Do you realize that God wants to see the nation's reach for Jesus Christ? And I believe there are far more people that God is calling than are answering to go. And I'm convinced of this. If this church would get desperate and really begin to bombard heaven, I believe you could see a lot of folks come through here and go to the fields of the world that are still white to harvest and be greatly used of God. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 18. I want to show you a very specific prayer and one that if indeed you're ever going to get saved, you're going to have to pray like that. A man came up to me one day and he said, if you get saved, you have to pray to get saved. Well, I thought it was a loaded question, but by the time I got to the car, I had an answer. If the word pray means to ask and you have to ask Jesus to save you, then the answer is yes. You have to pray to get saved because you will not get saved by accident. Now here in Luke chapter 18, we're going to see one man that got saved, one man that did not, and you're going to see the difference in their approach. Luke 18, 9. Speak a parable to this end that uh, unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. This is technically written to the Pharisees who believed that the Jewish nation were the only people that could have any favor with God. So we read verse 10, Luke 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a publican. Look up this way. Pharisee literally means separated one. They fasted two out of seven days, gave 10% of everything they owned, had Bible verses in their clothing. This was a very self-righteous man, publican. Publicans were Jewish IRS agents working for the Roman Empire that made their living by skimming off the top. They charged too much money and pocketed that. So here is a respected man, a rejected man. Here's an honored man and a hated man. The, even the, the Jewish people despise the publicans. Now they're both in the same place for the same reason they're going to pray. Look at the first guy's prayer. Pharisee stood, prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm other, others other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, I fast twice in a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. It's interesting, he commended himself, he compared himself, and he condemned others, specifically this publican. Now hold that thought, because there's his prayer. Now let's go down and look in verse 13, because the publican, standing afar off, so see him, he's not close to the Pharisee, would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven, he's got his head down, smote upon his breast. When somebody beat on their breast, it was a sign of self-accusation saying, and if you count them, they're only seven words, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now here is an eloquent, self-righteous man. 
Here is a no good for nothing, low down, skunk of a man. This man has got all of his words just right. This guy does well to get out seven words. Let's see who got heard. Look down, please, in verse 14, obviously, which follows verse 13. You hear the phrase, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, says Jesus, this man, what man? Publican, sorry, low down, crummy sinner, went down to his house, justified, interesting word, declared righteous, rather than the other. So God received the prayer of the publican, and he rejected the prayer of the Pharisee. Why? For everyone that exalts himself, that's what the Pharisee did, shall be abased. And he that humbles himself, that's what the publican did, shall be exalted. So let me put it, well, you won't forget it tonight. The Pharisee went to hell, but the publican went to heaven. The Pharisee told God all the reasons that he was a self-righteous man. And because he was so self-righteous, he damned his soul. But the publican, because he was so much of a sinner, came humbly and asked for mercy, pity, and forgiveness. And because this man thought he was too good and this man thought he was too bad, God said, I'm not going to receive your prayer, but I am going to receive your prayer because it's not what you do for Jesus that counts. It's what Jesus does for you that counts. Now, everybody is here or here. Everybody. There isn't anything in the middle. And we started over here. That's the reason that when some of you heard the gospel the first time, you got upset. Did he say, I couldn't go to heaven because I was confirmed? Did he say, I couldn't go to heaven because I was baptized? Well, I'm as good as any Baptist. And you were over here just like a Pharisee. But if you got saved like I got saved, I had to say, it doesn't make any difference my father was a pastor. It doesn't make any difference my grandfather was a pastor. Doesn't make any difference my uncle's a pastor because pastors can't get people into heaven. Jesus does. And I had to step from over here and I had to come to over here and I had to realize that as a preacher's kid, I could go to hell just as fast as a drunkard's kid. Now don't miss this or you'll miss heaven. When did you move from here to here? Well, when I was baptized, no, you're still over here. When I was confirmed, no, you're still over here. Well, I'm doing the best I can. That's what this guy said. You're still over here. Well, I, I, I don't rob banks, and I'm not an adulterer, and I don't even use profanity. You're still over here. You're still telling God how good you are. And you're justifying yourself so you're condemned. But when you know you're condemned, and you call on Jesus to forgive and justify you. He does for you what you can't do for yourself. This man came seriously. He had his head down. He beat himself on his chest. He came submissively. He said, I'm the only sinner in the house. I'm the worst sinner you've ever seen. He prayed specifically, God, have mercy. And God showed up in a big way. And nobody that's over here will ever go to heaven. So you answer the question tonight, if you want to go to heaven, when did you move from here to here? And if you're sitting here mad at me tonight, you're still over here. Because everybody that's over here had to realize that over here doesn't count. But when you move over here and you come to Christ, He gives you his righteousness because we don't have any. Close your Bible. Let me close the message. When Hannah came, she came seriously and submissively and specifically prayed for a baby boy. But the Bible goes on in 1 Samuel 1 and says she continued in prayer, which means she prayed steadfastly. Matthew 7, 7, Ask it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock it shall be opened unto you. All in the tents, it means keep on doing it. Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer. Romans 12, 12, continue instantly in prayer. There's a song we used to sing when I was a kid, just keep on praying till the light breaks through. Just keep on praying, 
he'll answer you. Was there something you used to pray for but you quit? Did you get discouraged? Did you wonder if God was listening? It's interesting that she kept knocking and seeking. Even when Eli said, what's wrong with you, woman? Are you drunk? <laughs> it's amazing to me. In Acts chapter 2, they accused him of being drunk. But that's when the Holy Spirit of God came. Evidently, sincere and desperate and all-out prayer is so unusual that the average person cannot discern that between being overly wrought emotionally. And I'll tell you this, when you come to God like Hannah, there are Samuels to be born. I want to do some things as I close tonight, I hope will help you. Unfortunately, I was a prodigal, my father was a pastor, but I was away from God, and I have had to deal with a number of those kind of people. I had an evangelist friend call me, and he said, you're coming to our church, and I'm not going to take a meeting that week, I'm going to be home, and he said, I hope you'll pray. My daughter's 20, and she's moved in with a married man who moved out on his wife, and she's having an affair. And he said, she's promised that she will come to church because she likes you. And he said, would you talk to her? And I said, sure. And that night I tried to help her after the service, but she'd already made up her mind. And so I looked at her, and I said, now I've known you a long time, and I'm just going to be extremely straight with you. You're living in immorality. And I don't know where the straight preaching went to go, but I want you to hear this from this old country preacher tonight. If you're having sexual relations with anybody but your lawfully wedded wife or husband, you're in sin, S-I-N, tonight. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, flee fornication. The next phrase says, every sin. You say, well, it's consensual. You're both in sin. You say, it's legal. You're still in sin. doesn't have to be legal. doesn't have to be illegal. Because there's a right and a wrong taught in the Word of God. Well, some weeks later, her dad called and he said, We've declared a fast, and my wife and I are going to pray. We're going to fast for 40 days. We're going to see our daughter come home. I said, Is she saved or lost? He said, I don't know. We're just praying whatever she needs. God will give it to her. 20 days into the fast, she came home. Rang the doorbell. Dad went to the door. There she stands. Daddy, I want to come home. Now, I'm going to lose a few of you right here. Her dad said what I would have said if that was one of my children. I want you to come home, but you're not coming home on your terms. You'll come on home on God's terms or you're not coming. Preacher, why would you say that? Because a lot of kids will run out of money. They'll come home and get your money and turn right around and go back and sin, and then you help them. And you're going to have to meet God for that. So you better make sure they're repenting, not just run out of money. He said, Daddy, I'll come home and I'll do whatever you ask me to do. A few days went by. He was to leave on Saturday for a meeting. Friday, she said, Dad, I'd really like to go to a meeting with you. You ever booked the last-minute ticket on Friday to leave on Saturday? They're not giving them away. But he bought one. He called me Sunday night. He said, Doc, I knew Sunday morning something was going on, but I didn't know exactly what it was. He said, Sunday night I was preaching and... All of a sudden, partway through the message, I heard a voice, and I knew it was my daughter's, and I heard her say, Daddy, help me. I'm going to hell. And he said, I turned, and she was coming down the left-hand aisle, and she had her arms out, and she said, Daddy, please help me. I'm going to hell. And he said, we went out to a private room. She trusted Jesus. Isn't that good? But it gets a little better. She went off to Bible college, and she married a pastor. They have three children, and she's a pastor's wife tonight. Could I get an amen? Amen. It's always too soon to quit. They may not listen to your words, but they have a hard time ignoring God's. And you can get to them by way of God. Don't quit. How many of you have unsaved family members? Would you raise your hand real high? Just about everybody in the house. Do you really pray for them? Do you really seek God? My father-in-law was raised in a religious home. Not a Christian home, but a religious home. When he was 20, he heard an evangelist preach the word of God and near about ran to the front to trade in religion for a relationship. And when he went back home, he told everybody what would happen. And they, his name was Joe, and they, his sisters called him Joey. They said, Joey's got his religion, we've got ours. He witnessed and witnessed. And one day, 
my wife and I were doing a meeting and she said, my six aunts would like for us to come over and have a full-fledged Italian meal. You ever eat a full-fledged, I don't mean Olive Garden. I'm talking about homemade stuff. We sat out at 11 and I tried to get up at 3 and they kept the food coming. On the way in, my wife said, are you going to witness to my aunts? And I said, I am. She said, they will get mad. I said, that's okay. They're Italian. I'm Irish. That'll be a real fight. Amen. So when we got through eating, I said, boy, I can't eat anymore. If I eat another bite, I'll burn Technicolor. Let's have coffee. And I want to talk to you. And all I'm going to ask you, ladies, is just to wait until I'm done. Then you can say anything you want. But if you'll just wait... He won't take me too long, and I went over the gospel. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I went over every detail of the gospel, and they never got mad, and they never threw anything, and they never got verbal with me. And when we walked out, my wife said, I've never seen that. (coughs) I said, God's at work. Just be patient. Sometime later, this one got saved, and that one got saved, and years later, that one got saved. And <coughs> The hardest one was Aunt Stella. Every time we witnessed Aunt Stella, here's what she'd say. My religion's good enough. You ever heard that? My religion's good enough. And so the last time that we were with her, my wife gave a wonderful presentation of the gospel, and it was not as adamant. She said, well, my, my religion's good enough. And then we got a phone call that Aunt Stella was not going to make it. She was in the hospital. She was totally conscious. But she'd come to the end of life. I called a friend of mine that's a soul-winning Baptist preacher, and I said, you, you, know, you and your wife been once. Would you go one more time? It may never be another time. And so they went. And he'd been to talk to Aunt Stella before, and he walked over, and she you know, recognized him immediately and thanked him for coming. And he said, you know, Aunt Stella... God's extended your earthly life to offer you one more time the gift of eternal life. And then he asked a question I'm going to ask you tonight. He said, Aunt Stella, is your religion good enough to die by? You better think about that tonight. Because everybody here is going to die. Is your religion good enough to die by? And if you just said no, you better get rid of it and get Jesus. And she began to weep. She said, no, no, it's not. He said, Aunt Stella, don't you want to be? I do. He said, would you let me help you pray? Yes. I had him on speakerphone when he was telling my wife and I the story. He said, Brother Farrell, she started. He said, I prayed, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. He said, she didn't pray that. She prayed, dear Jesus, I'm a bad, bad, bad sinner. You know what she did? She went from here to here in one statement. One statement. She changed sides. And she trusted Jesus. And three weeks later she died. But she's not in hell. She's in heaven. And I'll tell you why. She finally realized her religion would send her to hell. But Jesus could take her to heaven. And she came seriously and submissively and specifically. I hung up the phone after thanking the preacher, and I hugged my wife, and she was sobbing. And I said, baby, how long did you pray for your aunt? She looked at me, and she said, honey, I prayed for my aunt for over 50 years. It's always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to quit. Did Hannah get the answer to her prayer, yes or no? What was the little boy's name? It means ask of God or gift of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did for Hannah, he wants to do for you. Let's bow our heads to pray. How many of you could say, Preacher, there's been a time and a place in my life